Welcome back to another episode of More Than Just a Recruiter. I'm your host, Justin Brantley, and I'm extremely excited to introduce this next guest to you. Uh, as I was putting together some information on this year's hiring cycle, one name really stood out to me, and it was Coach Justin Gray. And the reason why his name stood out so much to me is because he's the exact opposite of what we often hear about when we talk about minority coaches ascending to the role of a head coach within Division I college basketball. Uh, coach Gray is in his fourth year coaching. That's unheard of to see a guy get an opportunity as a Division I head coach in their fourth year. So automatically, I was intrigued and wanted to learn more and know more about his story, know more about his journey. Um, and shortly after that, I was invited to attend a Zoom that Coach Jason G was putting on that had Coach Gray on it as the speaker. And I got an opportunity to listen to him and hear him speak and hear his philosophy and his approach to you know, not only basketball and coaching, but just to leading young men in general. Um, and I was absolutely blown away. And I could see that this is a leader. I could see that this is somebody that, you know, if I was in that interview room, without a doubt, I'm going to say, hey, this is you know, one of my top three candidates and I need to learn more about him. Um, as the time went on and I got to know Coach Gray a little bit more, uh, I learned quite a bit about him. I learned that you know, since his time at Western Carolina over you know, less than a six-month span, he's already raised over a half million dollars to you know, contribute not only to the basketball program, but to Western Carolina as a whole. And you know, when you see that type of impact and you see you know, somebody that's able to, to rally the troops and have that kind of support uh, and backing, that lets you know right there you know, the type of genuine relationships he's built along the way. So um, I knew that he was somebody that I wanted to have a sit down with. And I decided to go visit Western Carolina University and get a feel for myself with, you know, number one, you know, what's going on there at Western Carolina University? What's it like to attend school there? But number two, just to have the sit down one on one with Coach Gray and get a better understanding and a better um, encompassing view of you know him as a leader, him as a man, and him as a head coach. Immediately upon arriving on campus, I was blown away uh, by the sights and sounds of Western Carolina University. You you look off into the distance and you see the mountains. Um, it's just a beautiful campus. Uh, I was actually there on the very first day of school. So students were just starting to arrive. You could tell the energy was there on campus. And as we walked through the common areas, players would stop and they'd give Coach Gray a hug. They'd shake his hand. You know, they were all anxious to tell him, hey, Coach, I'm just coming from my first class. And you could tell that these guys are already bought into what Coach Gray is building there. And it just was something that warmed my heart. Um, and I'm really excited for him to have this opportunity. You know, we talked about what this opportunity means. And we talked about, you know, not only just, you know, the impact of his career, but the impact of other young black coaches that are seeking out their first opportunities at a young age. Um, and, and it goes back to something that Coach Mike Boynton said to me, you know, when we talked uh, almost a year ago. And he talked about with Coach Shaka Smart and him championing his success. And he was saying, hey, you know, him winning is not me losing. You know, him winning is me winning. And that's what we need within the fraternity, within the community of black coaches within Division I college basketball. Uh, we need to cheer for their success. So assistant coaches all throughout the country, Coach Justin Gray is a beacon of light and hope for young black coaches that as aspire to be head coaches one day. Coaches that you know, say, hey, you know what? doesn't matter that I'm not too far removed from my playing days. I know this game and I know people. I know how to run an organization. Give me an opportunity. So it was really inspiring to hear Coach Gray speak. It was really inspiring to hear his path and his journey. And I'm excited to share this with you. So without further ado, here's the interview I did with Coach Justin Gray. Make sure to take a moment to like, comment, subscribe, share with any of your coaching friends that you know, may be thinking that, hey, you know what? You know, there's not an opportunity for me to one day be a head coach. Share with you know, the young men that are finishing their playing career and wondering what's next. And maybe they might have a passion for coaching or maybe you know, they might you know, want to stay connected to the game. Coach Justin Gray's story is one of those ones that you can share that, that inspires and, and hopefully will motivate the next, the next group or the next batch uh, of up-and-coming you know, former players turned coaches. Enjoy. Coach Justin Gray, head coach of Western Carolina basketball, um, just had an amazing tour around campus. Uh, you, you can see clearly that there's a lot that's happening. There's a lot that you guys are investing into the program, investing into the success of these young men moving forward. Talk to me a little bit about you know coming in in a COVID year, your first head coaching job, and being able to tackle all these different projects, but at the same token, 
got to win on the court. So talk to me a little bit about your mindset, your perspective coming in as a first-time head coach. Well, that's a good question. The first thing I, I always say is be who I am. I tell my players, be you. I tell my staff, be you. That's all I can do. Um, I know they brought me here for a task. That was to, to, to lead them to success. That's all I'm here to do. So it's like I can't go in and bite the whole apple and eat it and finish it and do it. I know I'm not there. What I can do is set up the, the, the steps to be successful. That's all we've been doing. I did that with my staff. I think we'll be the top three staff in our league. I did that, and I got lucky enough to have an athletic director, a chancellor, as top three in our league. Those are the foundations of it. Now when we go out and get the players and we're building the culture and they understand what the standard is, now we'll win games. So that started long before I got here. I'll give those guys the credit of the things that's going on facilities, um, the things that they're trying to do to make sure that our student athletes have the best experience that they possibly can here. And now it's up for us to go out and show what Western Carolina is about. You talked a little bit about the foundation and building that winning culture. Uh, you've been a part of a lot of winning cultures, you know, all the way back from playing at West Charlotte and the things that you were doing in high school. But, you know, on a, on a bigger scale, on a national scale, at Oak Hill, um, you, you guys – you know, one of the best teams in the country every single year. Every time Oak Hill steps on the floor, you know you're going to have a game. Uh, at Wake Forest, you, know, you did some amazing things at Wake Forest. How does your experience and your success that you've had as a player translate to your ability to lead you know, these young men that their goals, their their dreams are your real life? It's what you <laughs> live. It's the path you've walked. Talk yeah. to me a little bit about that. I think it's the confidence. I think that's where it all starts. It starts with the vision of knowing where you want to go. At a young, very, very young age, I knew I wanted to be a pro. You know, the dream was obviously to be playing the NBA. I didn't know how to get about it, but I saw Jeff McGinnis, who was someone in my neighborhood that was really, really good at basketball. Went to Oak Hill, went to Carolina, played in the NBA, had all those successes. And I sat back from afar and watched until he allowed me to come work out with him. You know, and like, that's how it was. You didn't. I didn't know anything. Single parent. My mom didn't know anything about basketball. Nobody in my uh, family had graduated from college, so that experience is wasn't wasn't there as well. But then it was getting into finding out basketball can take me somewhere, um, and then it was that confidence of knowing that I've worked so hard every day uh, on my game on certain things that I'm gonna go out there and leave it out on the line. That's all I do now. It's, it's no different than, than basketball. I come in here early. I map out the game plan. I go over practice. I watch film. I talk about budget. I talk about what we're doing for classes, where our guys are going to live, recruiting plans. All those things go into it, but it's just a day-by-day, step-by-step. Uh, and I've never, ever tried to skip a step. you know. So with the successes I had at uh, West Charlotte, I started out on JV. But they moved me up to varsity. We won a state championship. When I went to Oak Hill, everybody said, don't do it. You, you just want to stay championship. You guys are going to be great. Me and Curtis Withers um, played, played at West Charlotte. Really, really good college basketball player. Was a pro, played in Europe for a while. Coached by Gosnell White, who was a legend in Charlotte. Like, I talked to him and he said, look, it's the best opportunity for you. You don't have that happening a lot these days where coaches are telling guys to do what's best for the guys. That's where I get my coaching style from. I'm a player's coach. I want you to be successful. I know it's not the X's and the O's. I know it's not. It's the Jims and the Joes. I need the guys. I can't win any game. I'm not out. My I tell the guys all the time. I'm done playing. I, I can play half court and three on three maximum. There's more guys than that. I, I feel uncomfortable right now. You know, but the the game is never changing. It's evolving a little bit, but the workouts are still the same. The hard work is still the same. All those things go into it. That's the steps that I learned from West Charlotte. To Oak Hill, then going on to Wake. Wake was another level because it was ACC basketball, something that growing up in that area as a kid, that's all I, I, I thought about. And my dream was to play at Carolina. <laughs> you know, and then once that didn't happen and they told me I was number four guy on their list, it was a it was a, a, a chip that we have on our shoulder. That's that same chip that I bring to Western. That's that same chip that I want my guys to perform with and play with. And that same hunger to go out and to, to not only just be on the court with some of these bigger bigger schools, so to speak, but compete with them and win.
you talked a little bit about your journey and playing with that chip on your shoulder. And as we walked around today, you talked a lot about player development and getting guys better. Your career at Wake Forest came in freshman year, averaged 12.7 points per game. When you left as a senior, 18.2. You, know, you scored almost 2,000 points over the course of your career. How important is player development in getting guys better? Not necessarily. Obviously, the job is to, to, to win, yeah. right? Um, coaches are often and more, more likely than not, they're judged on the wins and losses. But the reality, the true, uh, to me, the true measure of coaches, are they able to get those guys better and mm-hmm. get them from point A to point B? So talk to me a little bit about your – your game plan for player development, your emphasis on getting guys better. Yeah, I think player development is huge. One thing we like to call our staff is life coaches. So we, we talk about all the points that I've scored and uh, all the records at Wake and all those things, but you didn't say much about how I went from a young boy to a man, you know, and the mistakes that I made throughout that process and even after that I always fall back to the coaching that I had by skip process. Those messages, those things, I can get in a group chat with some guys and they come through us all the time. That, that's the development that I really, really aspire to make sure that our guys know and they will get from our staff is when you leave here, you'll be a man that's ready for the world. The world is unkind, it's harsh, it's all those things, but it also can be a beautiful place to be if you're following the right steps and you're understanding things not always going to go your way. So we attack it by that. And then basketball wise, like I said, it's no secret. You can't skip any steps. Those guys that have that that we've had here over the summer, they see the work. They see their bodies changing. What does that do? That gives you confidence. That's all we're doing. All we're in the business of is changing the habits. We change your habits to good habits, and now that work continues to be good work. Now things, success starts to happen. Now you score 2,000 points. Now you win games. Now you hang banners. Now you cut down nicks. Now you get rings. All because of the work that you put in. You know, and I tell the guys that walk has to match that talk that you that you say, I want to be a pro. You said it. I didn't. I didn't say that. So guess what? I'm going to hold you to a pro standard. What did you eat? What time did you go to sleep? When do you get in here and get some reps? Why, why do I have to tell you to do these things? That's not what a pro does. A pro is on its own. It's starting to go. But now in college, we have to lay the road for them, show them the path, give them that so they understand. Nobody's going anywhere else now without Waze or Map, you know, Google Maps on their phone. That's all we do. We give you the Waze. This is the route. Follow it. Once you get it, now you understand. You don't need me as much. Now you're doing it on your own. Now you're becoming a pro. So when we talk about development, that's how we like to attack it. For me, student athlete is real. You know, I know the value of education. I wouldn't be sitting in the seat if I didn't get a if I didn't get my education and I took it seriously. So we always, always, always value that piece. But the development is a whole development of the young man. It's not only on the, only on the basketball side. For sure, for sure. And as you talked about that, I mean, so many things show your, your level of maturity and your approach to this. And I mentioned that because, you know, at 37 years old, getting your first head coaching job, um, you know, two years removed or three years removed, you had your first year you were a player development coach at Wake Forest, mm-hmm. uh, two years as assistant coach. Now here you are as a head coach. A lot of guys in the business, a lot of guys that look like us are often considered or viewed as just recruiters. Yeah. They're often viewed as guys, hey, he can go get me a player. He can go do this. You've taken your approach, um, and we talked about it a lot today and talked about mm-hmm. it in the past, approach to the business side of the game and understanding how to be a CEO and run an organization knowing that that's what it's going to take in order to be a head coach. Do you feel an added responsibility as a guy that's getting an early chance to be yeah. successful to pave the way for the next guy? Yes, yes and no. Um, no, because everybody's different, right? So I want everybody to understand you attack what's best for you the best way that you see fit. For me personally, I say yes because I know I wouldn't get a, another opportunity. If this doesn't go right, if this if something goes left in a sense, doesn't go the right way, they're gonna be a little bit hesitant next time to hire somebody that looks like me at this age. I'm like, oh, we need a little bit more experience. The thing I do know is why I'll be successful is because of my staff. I was smart enough to know if I put a Jason G around me, if I 
put a Brian Graves around me, if I got a Zach Friesman, if I got a Molly Bashan, you know, like that group, that staff is going to carry me and try to, it's going to elevate me, but I tell them all the time, it's not about me. I might be the face of it, but I know for sure I got great people around me that's all handling. So I can focus on what I'm really, really great at. That's the basketball side of things. That's who I am. I'm a hoop guy through and through. So that that's something that I learned maybe from Skip Prosser, uh, maybe from Mitch Shaw, who's, who's a well-known businessman in the weight community. Um, don't be the smartest one in the room and don't think you're the smartest one in the room. You know, like, cause then, and then always having humility, always being, you know, showing a sense of gratitude to the people that are around you. That's how I carry it. That's who I am. You know, and I can't change that at all. So um, anybody that's trying to be this, I would say, make sure you know that <laughs> for sure. No, no doubt. No doubt. And I think that you touched on something, which is the network. And, you know, the cliche saying is your network is your network. Mm -hmm. But the reality is one of the things that you've done a very good job of is genuine relationship building. Um, I, Chris Paul, when he came in to wait, as a freshman, you were a sophomore, uh, you guys were roommates. And one of the things that I've learned, being a collegiate athlete, you either really love your roommates <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or you can't stand them down yeah, yeah, the line, yeah. right? So around you are some genuine relationships. You know, what has it been like having guys like Chris Paul to be able to lean on and, and make a phone call and say, hey, you know, this is what I'm thinking. What do you think? Or what's your perspective? Or even when guys are saying, Hey, I want to be a pro, and you can get Chris on the phone and say, "Hey, this is what it's taken for me to be in the league mm -hmm. for 16 years. Yeah. You're gonna to have to do this in order to get to that point." Mm -hmm. I think it goes. It is that, and it's it's just being a brother. You know, like the thing that people don't understand is how close you are with your college teammates when you're there. It's like you, and then everybody else. Like you hear people say, "Yeah, the regular students." You be like, "Well, what is a regular student?" You know what I mean? Like. You go to school, you just play basketball, you know, and that's not who you are. The one thing that we, you know, and a lot of guys on that team understood was we didn't want to only be seen as athletes in basketball. You see that through Chris now and the things that he does and the way that he speaks and who he, what he represents. But it's always good to call up your buddy or shoot a text and not talk basketball. You know what I mean? Because everybody in the world wants to be like, man, come on, dude. Got to get you a championship. You hadn't done this. You hadn't done that. And then we call and it's like, yo, what baby girl doing? You know, I, you know, or how's the fam? You know, what's going on? Like those instances are more so what the relationship is. Now that I got into coaching, it, he called me like, man, congrats. You know, you in there. What we need to do to be successful? You know, and that's not me going out and asking. That's just him being genuine. And there's other guys that have done that as well. The Ish Smiths of the world who went to Wake. Like the relationship that we had that are tied back to Wake Forest were real. That's what I want to bring here. That's that that's what that what we need to build here is that real brotherhood, that real power of the unit. Um that doesn't matter. Year, class, whatever where I'm at in life, I can call somebody and be like, look, man, how you doing? I might need some help in this. Can you help me? Yes. What you need? You know what I mean? Like, that's how we build it. That's what is really going to, you know, really, really going to take off. And we're making strides to doing that, you know. So the relationship that me and Chris has is like, you know, big brother, little brother. I'm the big brother for sure. You know, I always I always tell people before, they're like, man, how did it feel to play with Chris Paul? I was like, hold on. We won the ACC before he got there. <laughs> Get on the boat, young fella. Grab a paddle. <laughs> the thing about Chris was he was – such a, a gritty, uh, hungry, talented, smart player that he'd do whatever we asked. You know what I mean? Like, we go going here to do this, you know, come and get shots here, do this, we're going to pick up. And then it started to, well, we started to realize, like, hold on, he's a little different now. This, this dude a little different. The story is, he wasn't supposed to start. Like, he, was, he came in freshman year, was not supposed to start. Teron Downey, who used to, used to give him some buckets now, he, he, we go at it. And then all of a sudden, right before we go to Madison Square Garden to play Memphis, um, Teron had to get at, had to get his appendix taken out. Missed the trip. Chris is in the starting lineup. Spin move. Oh, he's a diaper dandy or whatever Dickie V said at the moment. Never came out. Coach was like, you know what? I think we need to start three guards. 
you know. And that was the that was the moment where he's supposed to be coming off the bench to now he's starting. And now, you know, the work that he put in, that dedication, like he wasn't giving it up. He wasn't giving up that starting lineup. He went, you could tell that he wanted it. That's why we were good, because there was no jealousy. There was no like, ah, oh, man, this, or what we like to call in my program now is BCD. No blaming, no complaining, no trying to defend why you're right. That's what happened. That's where we're going. It's not a democracy. This is what it is, you know, and that's what we had back then. That's why we won all those games. That's what the success really came from. That's awesome. That's awesome. And one of the things you touched on, you touched on your conversations with Chris being non-basketball, <laughs> right? Like, what are your kids doing? How's life? How's your wife? You mentioned earlier on when we were talking, being a kid coming up with a coming up with a single parent household. And now you're a guy that, you know, you, you played with Carmelo, now you're seeing him as a dad being there with his son, yeah. you're being able to watch his son. You know, you played against LeBron. Now you're able to get in the gym and see LeBron and his son, uh, Chris and his kids. You talked to me earlier when I got here. You said, hey, it was your son's first day of school. Yeah. And there was a different level of pride and joy that came from you. Talk to me a little bit about the perspective of, you know, being that father that you didn't have. Yeah. And the impact of, of fatherhood, especially black fatherhood, on these young men, not just as ball players, but just as people overall. Yeah, I think it's it's something that really doesn't get highlighted as well as it should, especially for the good fathers. It's always been, oh, his dad's not there, or oh, he's you know selling drugs, or he's done this, he's done all the negative, which is what the media does, you know, so to speak. But it also has to be a light on the guys that's doing it the right way, and today's age with social media and all these if we like if we highlight those things and we 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 celebrate being a good father guess what we'll have more good fathers that 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 follow me personally not not being around my dad it was a it was a it was a void there where my grandmother was stern my mom was a little chill more laid back but my grandmother was the one that if she said it, by all means, it's gonna happen. Like I ain't. It was no. But what this? No, it was no. It was not a democracy. I tell you that. It was go pick out a switch. I don't know if I'm from the country where they make you go get a switch. I'm like, you gonna make me go pick my own misery? Yes, go get it. But my 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 grandmother, you know, used to tell me all the time, like you'll be just as strong without, you know, because we'll be we'll be the iron fist. We'll land it down. We'll We'll praise you. We'll discipline you. We'll do all those things. But it's always different. And it, it, and it affected me young. When I go to a, and my coach, I, you my dad, you know what I mean? Like that conversation would come where he tried to tell me something. And I had to like, almost the fighter stance. Like, hold on, who you think you talk? Like, that was because I didn't have a father. That was because those conversations never happened. Those, those That co confrontation, all those things. Now, when you get a kid, I was that kid. When I go to college, Skip Prosser tell me something I don't like. I'm like, what? And then it realized, like, hold on, I got to be submissive. As much as I, as much as I want to fight and I want to bucket, if I submit it just a little bit, trust them. And it took me a while, me being a young brother from the from the hood, to trust somebody that didn't look like me, that I really didn't know. And all I saw was driving around in a, a gold, a champagne Mercedes S550, big boy. And I can't get something to eat. You know what I mean? In my mind, I'm thinking like, what what does this picture look like? You know, and so for me, growing up and now going out and seeing the LeBron James and seeing the Carmelo Anthony's and knowing what kind of father Chris is and all the attention that they have and they're present, it makes me feel good. So yes, when I go drop off my son for the first day of school, I'm 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 hyped. He's he's asking about his locker. I wanna see the locker. You know what I mean? Like it feels like I'm going to middle school, you know, so I, I'm just excited to be a dad. And I, and I always love seeing African-American men be in their son's lives. Daughters are important, too. Yes, indeed. But it's nothing like seeing a man teaching, you know, a young man how to be one. So that's all it is. And just the, the pure excitement, you know, when you see LeBron celebrate, he's celebrating his son. 
you know, and for him to sometimes get scrutiny over those things, I'm like, dude, it's his son. How you gonna tell him how to celebrate? That you, you should let him know that he's human. Everybody sees him on the court and they think he's a robot. They think he's a machine because how he performs and how long he's done it and all these but human beings with real feelings, right? Sometimes they come out. So uh, it's no different than what I tell my guys here. When I first got the job, I told him I had seen Doc Rivers do it. And he came in and was like, my name is Justin Gray and I'm going to make mistakes. Just be honest. And they see that, hold on, coach doesn't think he's here. you know. Now, what I say is here. You know, when, when we come in and talk, it's not a demonstrative. We say we're going this way, we're going that way. But I also know people make mistakes. I've made them. You'll make them. But I'll be here to catch you. I'll be here to say, watch out for the pothole, son. Son, watch out for the pothole. Boom, you hit the pothole. All right. Watch out for the next one. You know what I mean? Like, that's just how it is. That's life. That's what we go through all the time. So just trying to make sure that they know that I'm here for them, not trying to be their fathers at all um, if they don't. You know, if they want me to, I will. But I want to be more of a just a leader, a mentor, someone that they can throw ideas off of and I can give them my best opinion because in the real world, that's why it goes. You make the final decision. It's your choice. You got to live with it. I want you to be you. I want you to feel comfortable with it. So seeing going back to the fatherhood. It's nothing like it, man. Like seeing those guys in the gym and enjoying the successes and being there for the failures. Right. When they don't play as well. What's that conversation like? You know, so I think that's that's just as important. And it's it's probably really good to be LeBron James' son, but it's also probably hard as crap, too, you know, with all those pressures and everybody watching everything you do. And in this time and age, you know, in this day and age, it's, it's, it's a whole nother story. Same thing goes for all those superstar kids. The importance of leadership yeah. and, you know, everything I've heard from you, everything – talked about from the moment we walked in the door the way you carry yourself the way you walk the way you talk the way you lead leadership and leadership by example uh one of the things that stood out to me coming in your office is books i love to read i love to you know to, to sharpen myself sharpen my my mind um talk to me a little bit about being a student not just a student of the game of basketball obviously that's the easy part yeah you know you've been, you're a basketball yeah. guy um but being a student of leadership being mm-hmm. a student of management a student of you know, see of being a CEO, being a head coach. Talk to me a little bit about being a student of that part of the game and how that's helped to carry you and lead you where you're at now. Yeah, I think that's. I would always say I was always a leader. Um, just naturally, I was someone that always could go out and make friends. I could always go out and come have a conversation with different various people, no matter what kind of venue I was in. I felt comfortable. I think that's the first thing of being a leader, like feeling confident. You know know what you're talking about the only way i know is by getting the information i go out and read books i go out and ask i literally this morning before we met went down to our head football coach current bell been a head coach way longer than i've had. i've been in coaching i asked i got jason g who's been head coach at two different locations been in college basketball for 31 years got a really good resource over there so sometimes it's listening <laughs> you know what i mean like leaders do all the talking a lot but sometimes it's going in and getting information and just sitting back and processing it, letting people talk and, 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 and figuring out what do you like, what do you not like, what is something that picks your brain. The reason I'm in coaching, honestly, because of Danny May. It gave me an opportunity to be there with those guys and just sit back and my voice mattered and my opinion mattered. And I would, I would sit there and like, man, this is, this is fun. You know, like I wasn't playing, but I was still a part of a team. I was in a locker room. I was still trying to figure out how we make people better. How do we win games? That itch started there. And then that's when I started reading. That's when I started calling people and asking questions, getting as much information, putting a book together just in case something happened and a job opened up. You know, so the leadership is in me, um, but I don't know everything. You know what I mean? But I'm willing to learn anything. If that's watching a, a, a documentary, if that's reading, if that's going and listening to people speak or going meeting people or Zooms, whatever it is, the more information can only help me. You know, it can only help me help my program. So that's how I am with it. Um, and then I, like I said, I've always been confident. The reason I'm confident is because I do that work. 
I, I put in that time to know this is what we're doing. I know it'll work. I've done it. I've seen it happen. Let's go. For me, it's simple. Um, but I do know I have those qualities. Um, and I just have to sharpen them. It's no different than any anything else. So what can we expect to see from Western Carolina basketball this season? Yeah. You'll see a team that plays hard. I mean, there's three things that we always talk about daily. It's relentless effort. I mean, I want you to play so hard that you really need to come out the game. I want you to play so hard that you feel exhausted. I can see you punch drunk, as we call it. You running, you feeling like I gave everything I had. Not for me, for the guy to the left and the guy to the right of you. The second is competitive excellence. Compete at the highest level in everything that you do. Compete with yourself every single day to get better than you were yesterday. Ask questions so you can figure out what, what did I mess up on. That's competitive nature to me because if I messed up on it, guess what? I don't want to do it again. I want to be better than I was that time. Compete in everything. The last one is power of the unit. It's how we are. It's, it's, it's how I care about you. It's the person that's inside and knowing my guy on my right got my back. I got my staff back. Players know I, I'm supporting them. I'm fighting for everything that I can do to make sure they have nothing but the best. Then on the court, that comes through because the kids don't really care about what I've done or points I've scared. They want to know who I care about. And that's once they figure out that, now they'll run through a brick wall for me. That's what we build in here. That's what you'll see on the court when you come to games. Um, and hopefully that translates into wins. Thank you.